Before we can talk about the Dodge Revolutionary Union movement known as DRUM and the League of Revolutionary Black Workers, it's essential we examine the history of class struggle in Detroit. Detroit became a center of gigantic industrial factories, primarily in the automobile industry. Tens of thousands of workers moved to the city of Detroit to find high paying jobs. Black people moved to Detroit during the process of the great migration where millions of black people moved from the South to urban cities to escape Jim Jane Crow, low paying jobs and vigilante violence from the Ku Klux Klan. Others such as Southern poor white workers, Middle Eastern immigrants, et cetera, also moved to Detroit. The big three automotive industries at the time were Ford, General Motors, and Chrysler. All three capitalized on this and created huge industrial armies. Factories such as the Ford Rogue River Plant existed, which employed almost 120,000 workers at the height of war production with the Second World War. The average worker in these plants worked to the bone, determined by the all-powerful assembly line. A worker would be assigned to a section of a factory and perform the same task thousands of times a day. There were more dangerous sections in the factory that correspond to the social position of the worker, not only at the workplace, but also in Detroit. This is why foundry work, one of the most dangerous jobs on the plant, were predominantly employed by Black workers. This was not an unconscious racist act, but an intentional move to split the work, working class against one another. All of the big three fostered racism of the white workers, but one in particular, Ford, used a patronizing approach toward the black workers. Henry Ford, then owner of Ford and supporter of Hitler, had a web of connections to black churches and civil rights organizations, such as the National Action League. Ford would hire black workers in exchange for explicit open support from these so-called institutions of the black community. The Ford Rogue River plant at one point may have had around 70 to, um, its workforce was 70 to 80% black. This divide and rule tactic of the bosses was used primarily to stop the unionization of the plants. The 1930s, 40s, the 1930s and 40s in the United States saw a gigantic wave of labor militancy. In 1938, General Motor workers staged a sit-down strike at the Fisher body plant, refusing to leave the factory, preventing strike breakers from taking their jobs. This won the union recognition of the United Auto Workers and saw the sit-down strategy spread across the country. The United Auto Workers were a cutting edge of the labor movement during this period. The rise of the, of the Congressional, oh, sorry, the rise of the Congress of Industrial Organization which put forward the industrial workplace organ organizing rather than the craft union approach of the American Federation of Labor was a true mass force in society. Millions of workers associated themselves with the CIO, particularly black workers, as the CIO professed anti-racism in its practice and constitution. Communists and socialists played an important role in the formation of the CIO, and in particular fought against racism in the ranks of the UAW. It is important, however, to not paint a rosy picture. It wasn't easier to organize in the 1930s. The racism of the white workers was truly a barrier. For example, 25,000 white workers walked out on, off the job when the company placed three black workers at their section of the factory. On the flip side, black four workers often were under immense pressure to stand behind the company and fight against the union. Ford would repeatedly threaten to fire black workers by the droves if unionization would occur. More importantly, however, was Ford playing on the fears of black workers that were justified. The AFL's practice of white only unions, its exclusion of black people from the workplace and its laissez-faire approach Toward the embryonic civil rights movement spoiled the idea of a union to many Black Ford workers. Fearful of the seniority system, meaning mass firing of Black workers, someone actively worked against the UAW by either working with foremen to launch violent attacks on union organizers or actively participate in strike breaking. However, 
Ford would eventually be unionized by the, by the near end of the 1940s due to, due to the courageous organizing by the few Black UAW supporting workers, radical organizations such as the National Negro Congress and white UAW organizers who fought against the trifecta, Ford's phony philanthropy, the Black misleadership class, and state repression. What is incredibly relevant for us is the role that the youth played in unionizing the Ford factory. The NAACP's youth branch was incredibly more radical than its parent organization. Young Black people mobilized during the Ford strike of 1943, circling cars around the factory and pleading for multiracial working class solidarity in an attempt to get Black strike breakers out of the factory and they mobilized the entire community in support of the UAW. The union victory did get concrete gains toward obviously the working class, but especially black workers. The Seori system did not result in a mass firing of black workers. It was a boon to the black working class as thousands benefited and it created a layer of older black workers who had significant sway in their local unions. The UAW's edge was dulled by the 1950s increasing expulsion of communists and socialists from the union. In conjunction to this purge was the taking up of business unionism, which essentially is when the union leadership sees their interests most aligned with the company and that there must be an equal emphasis between capital and labor. This approach dis disarmed many workers and worse, young workers conflated management with the union. This will be an essential thing to keep in mind as Ryan talks about the approach of drum and the lead toward the UAW. The 60s was an explosive period of social struggle and a rapid advancement of consciousness in the United States and other parts of the world. It was also connected to the workplace, which often doesn't get talked about enough. Wildcats Wildcat strikes occurred frequently in the 60s and early 70s. And there were many labor reform movements, a labor reform caucuses in the unions as well during this time. This is explicitly seen also in Detroit through the Detroit Rebellion of 1967. The Detroit Rebellion was a multiracial revolt that caused significant damage that it, and it cost the city $500 million. There were around 33 black people and 10 white people killed during the, the revolt and around 7,000 were arrested. Both black and white workers looted the pawn shops, fought back against police repression and several shooting at cops from the rooftops. The cause of the rebellion seems nominal. The Detroit, uh, the Detroit, I said Detroit PPD, the Detroit Police Department arrested 80 plus in an illegal bar called the Blind Pig, which is basically a bar that takes place in a business after closing hours. In reality, it was the daily police harassment of black working people and a widening social chasm between the workers and the rich. It is important to take note that the Detroit Rebellion was led by working class people, many of whom had relatively higher salaries compared to other workers, especially in other parts of the country. As Marxists, we know that the wages aren't given to the worker after a product, say a car is sold in the marketplace. Wages are included in the production process of the commodity, the same as raw materials and the wear and tear of the means of production. Workers' ability to work for a length of time their labor power is treated as a commodity that is required to expand the productive capacity of the workplace. This can mean even if the worker gets paid nominally, the relative wages in comparison to the capitalist actually shrinks. And this is not an ironclad rule because as the, we know from the post-war period, the ruling class did allow an increase relative wages because of the boom situation. Workers were getting paid more, the capitalist class were also going to vote load of money. Why well, mess a good thing up was the logic of the ruling class at that time. But it's important to note, what does it mean for a worker in an assembly line or a foundry in intense, extremely intense working conditions who make maybe $30 an hour compared to the hundreds of millions of dollars made by Ford, GM, and Chrysler owners? 
Automation was an increasing feature during this period, which will pose important questions for Detroit workers during the firings that will occur later on. Some workers drew pessimistic conclusions from the increasing automation, meaning that the industrial working class is no more. Ryan will go into this phenomenon more deeply, but it's important to note that while the deindustrialization of Detroit significantly added to the Rust Belt growth, this does not mean that the industrial working class as a whole has been made obsolete. It's completely false. There are more, there's still 1.7 million auto workers in the United States. And there's also in the transportation and warehousing sector in the United States, four or five million workers. And it's obviously internationally, there's obviously the industrial working class in other countries. But Ryan, I think we'll go into kind of like the roots of that pessimism. The social position of the working class was battered and the position of the capitalist automo automobile owners is made stronger. The industrial workers in this situation, particularly black, showed increasing, uh, showed increasing contradiction of the speed up. Overproduction with little to no benefit to the actual worker in which the production cannot continue without. Black workers realizing their power is that the point of production was exemplified during the Detroit Rebellion, where curfew was exempt for factory workers and where they were allowed to cross the National Guard line to head to work. Production could even cease even in the midst of a rebellion. And it was these lessons that united a core of Black youth and workers to begin to form the inner city voice newspaper, which would later be the core organizing group of Drum and the League. If you're like me, you love a good edge of your seat cliffhanger. Fortunately, you don't have to wait a year to find out how a college printed newspaper like ICV or Inner City Voice became the center of a semi-revolutionary movement. Main writers at ICV were jailed during the rebellion that Eric spoke on. And in those jails, they said, it seemed like the whole assembly line was in there with them. This affirmed their long held belief that the revolutionary vanguard was the black working class. They, they used that risen consciousness around the rebellion to create a small following of black workers at the Dodge Main, collecting a small group at, attracted by the paper's coverage of incidents of police brutality and discrimination in the local plants with occasional longer articles of anti-war and local black news. At the meetings that they would have, uh, they discussed the articles, racial discrimination, and the conditions on the shop floor, and having uh, non-Dodge employees chair the meetings to protect them from spies. After the assassination of Martin Luther King Jr. in 68, they unexpectedly were presented with a larger opportunity as several spontaneous wildcat strikes were carried out by workers due to the production line speed up of that year. Although the strikes were instigated by both black and white workers, the focus of the struggles shifted quickly when Dodge laid most of the blame on the black workers, many people, including a future drum leader, General ba Baker, were either fired or suspended and United Auto Workers declined to defend the fired workers. It was this, it was this point that formed Dodge workers, uh, former formed Dodge workers and future drum leader Baker and 10 other black workers vowed to fight their dismissals and the suspensions, adopting the name of Dodge Revolutionary Union Movement to make it clear to the other black workers, their approach was not reformist. Based on two critical decisions of unity was the was the company's racist application of discipline and the union's unwillingness to defend black workers. They decided to remain exclusively black, hoping to convey to the 9,000 black workers that they had the power to control the production cap capacity and to create a bridge to control the communication gap between the multiple departments. Passing out leaflets discussing the issues from the multiple departments, hoping to consolidate the people around the same issues. The leaflets resonated with several black workers who started to look to, to them as the political leadership of, the, of Dodge Maine. Eventually raising their expectations, those worker, raising the expectation of those workers after eight or nine weeks. 
Baker's own assessment, by the time you put out leaflets about eight or nine weeks, people started saying, you're talking shit now. What you going to do about it? As a test of strength, Drum issued a flyer urging the boycott of the convenience stores and the restaurants in the area across from the plant that have refused to hire any African-Americans. The surprising success of the boycott indicated to the bake to Baker that these people were ready. This led to larger rallies and demonstrations and accumulated to Drum's official first strike on July 8th of 1968, where Drum called for the walkout of all black workers at the plant to avoid further retaliation against its leaders. Drum arranged for the students and the community supporters to distribute the flyers all over the plant. Baker boasted that about 70% of the black workers walked out of the plant crippling Chrysler's production for the better part of the next three, three days. Barring additional Wildcat strikes, Chrysler obtained an injunction from the court against Drum that prevented Baker and other leaders from further picketing on their property or around it. This proved to be a critical blow to the movement and that impact continued to be felt for months as Baker was the drum leader with the most organized experience and the strongest relationship with those workers. But despite that retaliation and the blow to the drum movement at Dodge, Maine, overall, it was a victory to the consciousness of drum and the future and the other rum movements. The news of drum spread, black workers formed revolutionary union movements rum at other Detroit area auto plants, as well as Blue Cross and Blue Shield, United Parcel Service, Henry Ford Hospital, and Detroit News. These efforts quickly outstripped Drum's own organizational capacity. They decided to form a league of revolutionary black workers throughout the city in early 1969 to coordinate the various workplace-based activities. One of the founding members, Miriam Kramer, and other women were instrumental in the formation of the league, a reflection of their growing importance within the movement. Women had performed many of the behind the scenes duties, including clerical work, leaflet editing, literature distribution, and they assumed leadership roles on picket lines and demonstrations to shield um, black work, uh, male workers from plant discipline. Not unlike the Black Panther movement, the league's culture still catered to men the most. Kramer herself said, male supremacy was rampant and we never got proper credit for fighting urban renewal and police brutality and defending the rights of tenants and welfare recipients. Over the next year, the league and its affiliates pulled off a string of protest activities, including additional wildcat strikes, a year long takeover of the student newspaper at the local university, many ele electoral campaigns on behalf of black militants seeking union office, demonstrations at the UAW uh, headquarters and high profile legal defense activities on behalf of black workers and other fellow radicals. Other activities included the operations of a book discussion uh, club and education reform coalition, a black student unit, United Front for uh, high school students and a national outreach effort to establish a revolutionary union movement in, in other cities as well. One of the of the rum extensions, L Rum of the Chrysler Eldon Avenue, created in 68, only six months after uh, Drum was created, built up support quickly due to deteriorating working conditions from the speed up. Um, to kind of give you an idea, they went from the numbers of 550,000 auto workers in 1946, making 3 million vehicles per year, to an increase of 750,000 workers making 8 million vehicles per year in 1970. The militancy of drum appealed to these workers. The, gro the growing LRUM um, actually exceeded drum's own numbers of, of, of members, um, which was particularly uh, not surprising because Eldon Avenue was indeed only, it was 60% black. But the speed up wasn't distributed racially and affected the entire workforce. Differently due to the internalized, intentional racial distributions of the workforce mentioned by Eric, but affected them all negatively nonetheless. The 60s and 70s most notably understood for the racial and social struggles 
and the deaths of prominent human and civil rights activists, as well as the birth of the largest socialist phenom of the Black Panther Party, Drum believed with some justification to appeal to young black workers at auto factories. Much of the experience came through the NAACP at first. And then on the left, they had connections of the Black Panthers and a, a national socialist organization called Uhuru, applying what they would call a Marxist Leninist Maoist uh, form, of, from, uh, form of revolutionaries that preceded them. And whereas Drum saw and respected these uh, former revolutionaries to a degree. They often would call them weekend revolutionaries, talk shit on the weekend, but work normally Monday through Friday. Um, and I say this all to say is that they that Drum, although evolved further than Black Panthers, by seeing that the Black working class of Detroit was a revolutionary force appealing to young Black workers, when, they had, when there was attempts from other left groups like the Wildcats um, would distribute agitation material um, around the same factories that the rums would, would be at, usually trading off days. If they ever crossed pickets, the rum workers would sometimes tell them it was a black thing and that they should get the hell on. This was an outpour of the contradiction of drums mix of black nationalism and socialism and the Maoist tradition of the vanguard of the most impressed. More functional than the Black Panther model of appealing to the Lupin proletariat or people who can only steal and or beg to be able to get by. This might have had some short-term gains um, as we can see and we'll discuss further, but would be a hindrance to the possibility of developing a class consciousness among other workers attracted to the wider leagues program. This spelled out detriment in the long-term struggles, like what workers saw as the possibility of control of the factories. Lacking a transitional struggle against compulsory overtime, that is when workers would work nine to 12 hours a day, six to seven days a week, um, they would have been able to build solidarity amongst the working, the working class at uh, Detroit, Maine, and at the auto works, which actually consisted of one in six people indirectly or directly connected to the auto program. Quality of life was decrepit in the factories with many, many a worker's deaths. Um, a prime example of the subpar work conditions is best seen through the lens of the court case won by Drum's legal force. Um, where a worker was dismissed on temporary bout of insanity after killing three people two foremen and a coworker at the workplace after the jury who were also uh, family and or currently um, members at the auto uh, workplace went to the factory and saw how terrible the conditions were. A similar case was won by the league's legal defense against a man who was accused of killing Detroit police officers who were known to have killed an astonishing number of young black suspects and were known to be uh, constant anti-civil rights activists. Despite these wins, the league's base in the, in the Detroit workers was disintegrating. Elrum, Elrum's rhetoric alienated older black workers and white workers who agreed with Elrum's criticism of the factory and the union's leadership with news, newsletters that would explain that stupid ass honkies needed to be excluded because of their past traitorous acts and their present mental condition. Even amongst the angry young workers, it might appeal initially, um, but weren't able to understand the long-term strategy for change. UAW had historically played a radical role in the 30s and 40s union movement even released in 1944, a video urging their members to understand the struggle against racism is essential to the union movement. But after the McCarthy era, Red Scare that Eric touched on and the pushing out of those, those militants, they basically supported the mainstream civil rights movement, but did little to, to challenge the industry's racist employment practices. Committed to any allegiance to the boss with a major goal to make sure that cars were profitable. They acquiesced to the company's demands and they were rewarded for it. 
One form of support was that the companies collected union dues directly from the workers' paychecks, freeing the union from the workers' tactics of withholding dues if dissatisfied with union performance. But not just that. During the General Motors strike of 1970, the company allowed the union to delay payment of $46 million into the health insurance program because of the fi financial burden associated with the strike. The union then gave a 5% interest to General Motors once the strike was over. So not surprising that the league had opposition to the union, but on the flip side, when a black sympathizer of the league's who had built up black and white support for his challenge to the UAW leadership at first appealed to them for support, but then saw them as a more of a liability to the radical challenge he wanted to uh, present to the UAW leadership, he then asked them not to support them in fear that they would alienate his supporters. He ended up losing by about 30 votes, likely more attributed to the UAW armed guard, although he attributes El certain elements to the drum movement. Their disintegration into the uh, Detroit movement didn't go unnoticed, but due to the lack of democracy within the organization and a mere bureaucratic approach, the personal and strategic differences amongst the leaders only grew in response. As their operations grew um, to the likes of bookstores, publishing companies, a printing press, and a national organization, the Congress of Black Workers, um, their disintegration is established even further. The Congress of Black Workers was a project of J James Foreman, who was in his heyday, an executive secretary of the Student Nonviolent Coordination Committee, SNCC, dur during its heyday as well, and a former brief minister at the Black Panther Party. And he was connected to much of the left and he also came with a major for source of funding from the faith-based communities. And he was impressed by what he had seen at the league. So he joined the organization and he moved to Detroit with the hopes to connect the black revolutionary workers movement of the North to the African-American struggles that were happening in the South. He saw documentaries like Finally Got the News as the potential to make multiple Detroits across the workers movement all across America. The outreach of the documentary, as well as The Guardian, The Radical America, The Movement, brought many international speaker engagements, putting the leaders of the movement on constant outreach. Many radicals moved to Detroit with hopes to connect to the league, only to find that they had no meaningful presence in the auto plants anymore. The documentary served as a double-edged sword as the workers in Detroit saw the leadership as having lost sight of its initial purpose. Some of these allegations ring true but others are rooted in the ideal of socialism in one city. Amid the constant struggle of sustained protests, spread, spreading them to different plants and protecting the workers when the companies came down, little was done to cultivate a rank and file leadership in Detroit. The decisions rested on the top-down leadership, which almost, would, which amongst many things also excluded the possibility of women's leadership. Whereas if the Black Lives Matter movement was to have made a turn to workers like Drum did and the league, it would be a positive for sure in comparison to where we are now. We would be in those union movements arguing for a better direction against the nationalist approach. We can see elements not as dramatic, dr drastic as the period was, but in the Amazon worker struggle with despite higher wage, Longer lunch breaks and better working conditions is a commonly held idea, multiracially. Not saying that they shouldn't support with Black Lives Matter, but that Black Lives Matter means that all workers at, Amazon's des at Amazon deserve to work in safe and humane conditions. Unmentioned before, but the Democratic Party played a huge role in opposition to the league's work because they saw their tentacles in the movement and at high schools and other organizations, um, as well as in the workplace as direct, direct challenge to their political hold of the city correctly. And this could have been a method of struggle, which if that was to happen today, we would push to, for that effort to take power. Although it's unclear in anything that I've read, and the comrades know uh, more information, that the, whether or not the league actually tapped into that. It is assumed that these log logistics are no longer 
the logistics around uh, the industry workers are no longer the powerful force that it once was because of the sheer number of workers is not at the same level and where that, that, that part is true, um, that it's not at the same level. Kim Moody um, wrote in his, new, in, in his book on the new terrain that he refused the idea that the industrial working class, which has, still has potential to stop production and thus has enormous potential power, has declined. Moody quotes the Economist magazine for all the belly aching about the decline of American manufacturing and the shifting of production in mass to China, real output has been growing at an annual pace of almost 4% since 1991, faster than the GDP growth. For Marxists, cohesion and opportunity for unity are key to understand the potential power of the working class. The main division fostered by the ruling class in the US has been race. Other divisions are national background and geographic location. Moody provides important insight into two of these issues. The workplace is more integrated now than it ever was before. Women are 51% of the workforce and are employed in a much wider variety of workplaces than previously. They now represent 37% of construction, 28% of warehouse workers, 22% of transportation, and 41% of information workers. Black, Latino, Asian workers now represent 33% of the workplace. Forced to work in lowest paid jobs, they will play an important part in the working class fight back as it develops. Already largely female teachers and nurses are playing a vanguard role in rebuilding the labor movement. Women also make up 46% of all union members while black, Latino and um, Asian workers now represent 33% of union members. These are all quite large increases in the last couple of decades. Also 13% of unionized workers are immigrants. This demonstrated the growing diversity of the union movement, which will greatly increase the ability of the working class and the oppressed to act cohesively and to reach support among wider working class struggles such as Black Lives Matter, immigrant rights, LGBTQ, and the emerging women's movement. An essential aspect of the ability of the working class to cohere into a powerful force is proximity to each other's struggle, either geographically or within larger workplaces. Success in organizing workers of different trades into one union was crucial to the victories of 1930s, by uniting their struggles, steel, auto, and rubber workers were able to shut down U.S. Steel and other huge companies and force them to recognize a union and start to pay decent wages. These unions also united workers from different races into a united force. Although the capitalists have tried to stop inner city factories like those drums centered around by moving them to suburbs, inner city hubs have taken their, their place. The locations are based on their proximity to major urban centers, markets, docks, and airports. These are also areas with a high concentration of low paid workers looking for employment who are predominantly black or Latino. While the driving force of the concentration has been capitalism's insatiable lust for profits, the consequences has been to strengthen the cohesion of the working class. They work and live in the same neighborhoods, have similar types of work and rely on each other's labor in the productive system. It's almost as if the factories of 1930s have been recreated in a different form. Moody estimates that around 3.5 to 4 million workers are concentrated in these, no, these hubs of distribution. Some are unionized like the UPS and some truck drivers, but many are low paid workers uh, suffering with union without union protection in Amazon and other companies' warehouses, as well as in non-union trucking. Many have no set hours and work on contracts that force them to be on call. Also, the importance of air travel and distribution puts a huge amount of potential power into the hands of airport workers. Moody goes on to argue that the potential for a new upsurge of labor is the most favorable in generations to come. Not only have workers' living standards been driven down by, for decades, but teachers provided a reminder of the dynamism and the fighting spirit of the U.S. labor movement and demonstrated the power of the strikes as means of struggle when backed, by, backed up by the support for, from broader working class. 
He points to the newly emerging logistic supplies systems and distribution tr transportation hubs where capitalism is dependent on groups of workers who now have enormous power in their hands and can shut down the economy if they unite it in their struggle. As socialists, our role is to link up social movements within the broader layer of the working class and point towards um, the enormous potential of a working class to transform US society when armed with a class struggle strategy and dynamic fighting tactics. Thank you.